Thank you very much for coming out on what for you is obviously a cold day. <laughs> um, for, for me, it wasn't so cold and, um, and I walked barefoot on the beach for three quarters of an hour this morning just to prove it. <laughs> uh, and that's because I was particularly keen uh, to see some Florida sunshine, but the, the wa the wa there wasn't any, so, so I, I'm, I'm gonna be the only source of sunshine for the next 50 minutes. <laughs> So why the solar revolution? Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you a story that's, that says essentially we need to go back to the future. Uh, and we need to become a society that lives on sunshine. And the reason, the reason I've come to this view is, is because of my job. So essentially I'm the dean of science. And, uh, and I was looking for a story to tell about the University of Sheffield's research. And, and, it just, uh, and I'll, I'll explain how we got there. But first, I want to give you some background. So, so we have this thing that's central to the University of Sheffield called Project Sunshine. And it's about the science. And when I say science, I mean research in general. There's social science, uh, there's economics, uh, there's psychology. But it's, it's the science behind food and energy security for 7 billion people now and, and 10 billion people in the future. And, and part of the reason that that this is a great story for me to tell is that this guy uh, was my predecessor. So, so George Porter was a professor of physical chemistry at the University of Sheffield. He won the Nobel Prize uh, in 1967 for flash photolysis, which is a technique for studying chemical reactions by exciting the reaction with light and then following what happens with spectroscopy. And that led him to doing research on photosynthesis. And because he did research on photosynthesis, he drew this slide. So this is a 40-year-old slide. And it's a 40-year-old slide that has four and a half billion years in it. So, so the 40 years of old is irrelevant. Okay? So, the, so the four and a half billion years are since the creation of the Earth. So, so we have the Earth. It's a rock. It's near the sun. Oh, it's not so near the sun. Uh, it has water on it. And there's kind of chemical evolution taking place on the surface. There are molecules that are reacting because pools are drying out and concentrations are changing. And some of those molecules start to make copies of themselves. Um, but that doesn't really work because they get diluted and they fall apart again. And then eventually, th there's a step in evolution that, that puts pockets of chemicals in a bag. And that bag's called a membrane. And now you have, if you have a bag, you have an inside and an outside. And if it's different chemistry inside and outside, then you can pass molecules across the membrane or pass energy across the membrane. And that's life to a physical chemist. So it's kind of that simple. Okay? And then, then these bags started to essentially to ferment things. So they scavenged energy from their environment um, and eventually became the archaea that we know as, uh, as the kind of original anaerobic bacteria. So, so they didn't use oxygen because there wasn't much oxygen in this early Earth. It, its atmosphere was a reducing atmosphere, not an oxidizing atmosphere. And all of this stuff happened in water, right? And then eventually some of these, some of these bugs decided that rather than scavenging food from around and about, uh, we'll make our own food. Uh, and that was photosynthesis. So then photosynthesis started in the sea, and that started to change the environment. So there's two billion years where there's no oxygen in the air. And then for a couple of billion years, plants developed in the sea that put oxygen in the air that allowed, and that oxygenating process allowed multicellular organisms to develop, initially plants and then animals that ate them. And that all happened in the sea. And then, kind of half a billion years ago, some life crawled out of the sea onto the land. And that life was very complicated. You know, there was a lot going on in the sea. There'd been many, many uh, millennia of plants and animals evolving, dying out, new ones coming along. What came out of the sea to colonize the land? Plants. The first things that crawled out of the sea were the plants, and then the animals followed them to eat them. And that's really important. 
Because my botany professors tell me that this beautiful planet was created by the plants and the animals have been trying to screw it up ever since. <laughs> and we are the top animal. So my view of life is really, really simple. There are, there are two important reactions. There's one important reaction that takes light and uses a molecule called ATP as a vector to then capture carbon dioxide, split water, liberate oxygen, and make carbohydrate. So that's kind of the, 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 the life-giving reaction. Um, and then that passes on to these things called mitochondria that undergo... Uh, that convert that stored carbohydrate energy into ATP that's then used to drive everything else. Um, and plants synthesize carbohydrate using ATP, and everything else burns carbohydrate to make ATP, and then ATP drives all the other life processes. Um, but the key point is that plants and algae capture the energy that everything else goes on to use. So life escaped the sea, the plants came out of the sea, colonised the land, the animals followed the plants out of the sea onto the land, and then eventually we, we appear. And we appear 150,000 years ago. Now all of these processes essentially were cyclic. So, um, so the solar energy comes in, there's 100,000 terawatts of energy arrives on the earth from the sun. Photosynthesis, the light reactions liberate oxygen. The dark reactions split water, take an electron. Then that electron allows carbon, carbon dioxide to be converted into carbohydrate. And that carbohydrate makes organic molecules, uh, biomass, uh, food, uh, animals, uh, and fossil fuels that get buried. Um, and then kind of the thing that's lying around on the surface um, undergoes respiration uh, to liberate the energy, uh, then you die and stuff kind of ferments and decays, um, and there's some energy released back into the uh, universe. So another simple-minded chemist view of the world is, is the Earth takes in high-grade energy in the form of visible light and ultraviolet light and converts it into low-grade energy that goes out to heat the universe up, infrared, and that's what we do. So, so if you're a chemist rather than a philosopher, I don't think, therefore I am. <laughs> I pump heat, therefore I am. <laughs> and, and, and if you, you know, it's a kind of depressing view of the world, but I'm just the kind of a temporary heat pump. <laughs> As are you. <laughs> so these humans that, that arrived, um, the first 130,000 years of humans, not a lot happened. Uh, the chief economist of the Bank of England is, uh, is a University of Sheffield econ economics graduate. And he told me for the first 120,000 years of human existence, uh, the net growth in the economy was zero. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, then he told me that we learned to invest. Um, and so the, 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 the overwhelming kind of the, the recurrent growth rate was 0.0001% for until 350 years ago. Okay. Um, now, the group at the top had started the investment, right? And what they started to do was they're milling corn, yeah, uh, they're milling grass seeds. And then they, they learned to, to farm. And then the, the people at the bottom are also farmers. Um, so they, they were making food. These farmers, life had changed and they were collecting hops to make beer. <laughs> but this, this progression over tens of thousands of years, is, is an evolutionary blink in the eye of the eye. And these people are essentially the same. But the way they lived had fundamentally changed. Because 400 years ago, we all still lived on sunshine. 
Everything that happened on the earth in terms of the human beings was driven by sunshine. All the food was produced in year. Most fuel was produced in a lifetime from trees. Our population ebbed and flowed depending on the harvest. There were less than a billion people um, and about 400 years ago, Europe was entering the Industrial Revolution. Actually, I'll be more precise. England was entering the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> Actually, I'll be more precise. The north of England <laughs> was entering the Industrial Revolution. You know, iron and steel started in Sheffield for a reason. Okay, and it started for a reason. It started for an accident of geography that you will have learned about at school. The, the, the confluence of water, coal and iron ore. But there was the confluence of water, coal, and iron ore everywhere, all over the world. Why did it happen in that part of the UK? So at the time, the most fertile and heavily populated part of the earth was Southeast Asia, and it is today. But what was different about the north of England 400 years ago was it had the highest labor price, because we'd lost a load of people. Therefore, it, it paid to do the R&D to use this free form of energy that was kind of buried under the ground that was highly concentrated and easily portable. Because 400 years ago, no one used coal. They didn't really know about oil and gas was a pipe dream. Now, now the Elizabethans, they had peak wood. Can I use the evocative term peak wood? Of course, they didn't call it peak wood, right? But it's going to sound familiar. They had a growing population, food was in short supply, and they were running out of fuel. Okay? So it sounds really, really familiar. So what did they do? Well, well they innovated their way out of the problem by learning to use a different form of energy. And, to, and in doing so, they broke the solar cycle. Now... Human productivity wasn't dependent on the energy to drive the economy that came from the sun. They now had this buried form of energy. The family jewels were under the ground and they dug them up and used them to drive the economy. So the Industrial Revolution was started first by water power, but it was coal that really made the difference. It brought people into the cities, mechanization, increased agricultural production, steam power, accelerated economic development, and the materialistic society that was more broadly based than just the 0.1% of royalty are allowed the economy to develop. And the population started to grow both in the cities and on the land because mechanization had made the land more fecund. You could get more food out of an acre. I love this diagram, by the way, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's, um, it's a great scientific diagram because it has a scale bar. The, the scale bar is the dog. Okay? <laughs> and um, and it's, an, it's an early mine. And it's an early mine at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So kind of the things you recognise, gear wheels and stuff, you know, of engineering, they're there. But there wasn't, there wasn't steam power yet. And the pump that's draining water out of the mine is driven by people walking around inside the wheel. So coal and then oil and now gas allowed us to absolutely change the way we live. And we now live, this, these are pictures from the north of England. Uh, this is uh, Teesside, where there's a great deal of chemical industry. We now live cheek by jowl with this great big industrial complex that's driven by fossil fuels. So these, these are a couple of graphs of, um, of the Earth's population. So um, I've, been, yeah, I've been told I, I can't get up and walk around. I have to stand here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay stood here. So the top graph has, it goes from 1750 to 2150. The, the, the greenish colour along the bottom is the population in the most developed countries. The, the purple is the growth of the population in the less developed countries, and I've marked on a couple of things. 
So until about 1750, the, the doubling time of the Earth's population was about every thousand years. It might have been 10,000 years. It's kind of doesn't matter. They didn't, didn't double very often. Okay. Between 1850 and 1900, the time scale for doubling had dropped to 150 years. Now it's doubling in, in 20, every 25 years. It's actually only just started to slow down. What happened? Why? Well, the, the change in growth from 1750 to 1900 was because the use of fossil fuels had spread. Now, um, that productivity, because the Industrial Revolution started first, the first population growth bubble was in the UK. So between 1800 and 1900, the UK's population, uh, someone's beginning to tell me I've got that wrong, right? So I'll start again. From 1800 to 1900, the UK's population increased by a factor of four. Right? Four times as many people at the end of that century than at the beginning. Uh, so what did we need to do? We needed to provide four times as much food. So to provide four times as much food, you need four times as much land. Okay? So we ploughed more land. Problem is, it wasn't our land. It was your land that got ploughed. Okay? So the UK fed its population by food imports because Europe had reached the limit of productivity. In fact, it was running out of fertiliser. So every piece of excrement was used from every beast, including humans, and spread on the land. Now, Victorian scientists in the UK were obsessed with food security because we couldn't grow enough food. They knew we needed nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. So the phosphorus is easy and the potassium is easy. You get that from burning bones. But the nitrogen, and it was a couple of German chemists, actually a chemist and a chemical engineer, that developed the Haber-Bosch process. And that allows you to take nitrogen from the air and make ammonia and then nitrate that you can use as fertilizer. So at the turn of the century, the search for artificial fertilizer was on and it was solved by the Germans. Um, that technology didn't kind of spread around the world because the First World War got in the way and you can use nitrate to make explosives. So the technology got reused. But that population growth was accelerated by artificial fertilizer. And then Norman Borlag, um, an American agricultural scientist, worked out how to make the land even more fertile by plant breeding. So plants were bred to specifically take advantage of this new fertilizer. And these plants worked against evolution because they had short stalks and big ears. So they invested more in seed production than in seeking light. And that allowed the Earth's population to explode. So when the Earth's population grew by a factor of four, between 1900 and 2000, we didn't have to go four more, find four more new planets to farm because we'd made our land 10 times more productive. But in doing so, we'd come to rely on cereals that had been specifically bred to take advantage of this artificial fertilizer. And this artificial fertilizer is made by burning coal. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a reaction that you need to put energy into in order to make it work. So the bottom set of graphs, the blue line, is the Earth's population from 1900 to 2000. And the red line is the global consumption of oil. We existentially depend on burning coal and oil in order to feed 7 billion people. So this young lady, Danica May Camacho, who was born on the 30th of October 2011, is the UN's citizen 7 billion. In 2000, there were 6.1 billion people. It's taken 12 years to add another billion people to the population. And the next billion will actually come in a decade. Even though the rate's slowing down. So this, this is actually, this is, a, this is a picture from my hometown, um, from the Tour de France, okay? And uh, 
and you can hardly tell the racers from the spectators. And, and this is really a metaphor for the population of the Earth, right? We are absolutely jam-packed on the surface of this planet. And the problem we face is we've broken this cycle. Now, we're actually pumping out about 30 terawatts more of infrared than we were before. Because now, we're not burying lots of the carbon. We're actually digging it up. And this is a real problem. Now, I, I, I realize um, there are some of, the, of your politicians who don't buy into global warming, so I'm not gonna kind of push that. Uh, all I'll say is, I do not want to take part in the experiment. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, so the data on the global population is pretty clear. Uh, the data on the uh, carbon dioxide levels is pretty clear. Uh, there's argument about the global temperature. Uh, I just I came from I was in Racine, Wisconsin yesterday. I was watching the news, and the Great Lakes have been more than 80% covered in ice for the second year in succession. The way global warming's playing out in the Midwest is it's getting colder in the winter. And, and why do I say we'll get to 10 billion people? So it turns out that the average birth rate across the Earth is coming down to uh, two. Um, there are still some outliers, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, but there are some places where the birth rate's as low as 1.4 in Singapore. Uh, for example. It's 1.7 in the most Catholic country in Europe, uh, which is Italy. Um, it's 1.5 in the deeply Muslim country of Iran. Right? Why? Um, because they have lots of educated women, and educated women cause the birth rate to fall. So the global birth rate asymptoting to two. And that means we'll have 10 billion people because we have um, 2 billion infants. So there are currently 2 billion people on the face of the earth between 0 and 15. And when they're between 15 and 30, they'll breed. So there'll be another 2 billion 0 to 15 year olds. And then they'll breed and there'll be another 2 billion 0 to 15 year olds because you really can't stop them breeding. Right? <laughs> and then, then there'll be... There'll be 2 billion 0 to 15 year olds, there'll be 2 billion 15 to 30 year olds, there'll be 2 billion 30 to 45 year olds, 2 billion 45 to 60 year olds, 2 billion 60 to 75 year olds, then we've got 10 billion people, and kind of they start to, the population starts to kind of drop off a little bit after that, but obviously not here. Uh, <laughs> but but that's, that's going to make for a population of around 10 billion people. It might be nine, it might be 11, but we're going to have that many people. So we are really, really squeezing the earth for food and energy. And this next graph kind of is a redrawing of, of a graph I showed you earlier. So the dark line is the earth's population, and the two dotted lines, one's oil production, the other's fertilizer production. 3% of the earth's energy budget is spent on making ammonia via the Harbour Bosch process. And then another 3% of the Earth's energy budget is spent on converting that ammonia into fertiliser and taking it out to farms. Now, now another, another piece of background. Um, why, why, why is oil so good? Okay, so this, this comes from a book called The Physics for Future Presidents. And it has a whole range of objects and their energy content is, um, is energy per gram. Um, and the, on this axis is just a, the, the last column is just a row of numbers that says what they're like compared to TN, TNT. Yeah, what they're like compared to dynamite in terms of energy per gram. So something that you already know, batteries aren't really very good uh, as an energy store. Right, they're, you know, it's a, a factor of 20 lower than TNT. Um, Coal's 10 times more energy dense than TNT. Gasoline, coal's, gasoline's 10 times, 15 times more energy dense. 
Butter. 11 times more energy per gram in butter than there is in dynamite. Chocolate chip cookies. Eight times more energy density in chocolate chip cookies than there is in dynamite. Why? Okay. Because when you burn all those things, coal, gasoline, chocolate chip cookies, butter, two thirds of the mass comes from the air. It's the oxygen. And in dynamite, you don't need any oxygen because it's already in there. So, so this, this burning process is thermodynamically really, really good at storing energy. And the reason that we have dairy, my historian friends tell me, is that when trade develops, the first thing that was traded was food. Because actually trade was about making friends. And if you could make your neighbors survive better, then it made for good friendship. And the most energy dense form of food the thing that you can pack into the least space and carry is butter. That's why butter's there at 11 times the energy density of TNT. So trade started with food and energy dense foods were the basis of trade. That's why if you take kids to, if there were a bunch of kids in that canopy room, would they be eating cucumber and carrots? Uh-uh. <laughs> Right? They, go, they know exactly, we are hardwired to seek out high energy density food. So what do we need to, for 10 billion people? Well, we, to make it work, we actually need a different currency. Uh, we shouldn't be using dollars, pounds, euros, yen, or even renminbi. We should be using joules. Because the only difference between the joules that you have rated on your boiler system, your heating system, or kilowatt hours, or calories are the units. It's all the same stuff, it's all energy. So for 10 billion people, we need about three kilowatts per person of, of installed energy generation. And that's about twice our, the embedded energy of our food. So for 10 billion people, we need 30 terawatts of energy supply which is 14 terawatts more than we have now. And we also need that that energy essentially is all from renewable resources because we can't afford to put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So one way of doing it is nuclear, right? I'm a big fan of nuclear energy. So there are 439 nuclear power plants in 31 countries. There are 60 under construction in 14 countries. Um, if we're going to do this, we need 11,000 gigawatts of nuclear power if we're going to fill that gap, right? Which means building a gigawatt power station every day for 30 years. Okay? And when we've done that, we need to start decommissioning the first ones we build and building new ones. Right? It, it ain't going to happen. What about fracking? Okay, gas is cheap now, right? But fracking's a real problem. It, it reduces the carbon burden because you get more energy per carbon dioxide molecule. There are all sorts of environmental concerns, but my real concern about fracking is that it encourages complacency. If gas is cheap, why would you invest in technology for the future? And, and that's what we see, right? We're not investing quickly enough in the technology we, we need. But the, the good news is our planet's actually very, very small. So the little blue dot there is the Earth to scale next to the sun. And that great big loop is uh, called a, a, a mass eruption. And it's actually, it's a hundred times the mass of the Earth of plasma that's been spat out along a great big magnetic loop. Um, and the sun is our ultimate source of energy. So it's a fusion reactor. It's 93 million miles away. And all the energy we will ever need arrives at the Earth 8.8 minutes and 19 seconds after it was liberated in the sun. There's 100,000 terawatts 
intercepted by the earth, by this tiny little speck. And if we can capture one hour of sunlight, we can power the whole of the earth's economy for a year. So if the Martians turned up, the little green men turned up, they think, these humans, they are so stupid. <laughs> Wasting all the time digging this stuff up out of the ground that was sunshine buried millions or billions of years ago, when actually all they need to do is collect it. So let's wake up and collect it. And we need to wake up because energy transitions take decades. Now, the trains in Europe were burning coal for a hundred years before all the trains in the USA were burning coal. Your, your trains ran on wood. Casey Jones was throwing wood into the boiler long time after his equivalent was shoveling coal into the boiler. Energy transitions take a long time. So to go from 5% of the energy budget to 25% of the energy budget can take decades. So 1750 was the year when more energy was imported into London in the form of coal than in the form of wood or charcoal. So that kind of, for me, defines the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, but it took hundreds of years for coal to become the dominant energy vector in, in the world's economy. So coal took 35 years to go from 5% to 25%. After that, oil took 40 years to go from 5% to 25% of the total energy budget. Gas took 55 years to go from 5% to 25% of the energy budget. Nuclear, never gonna make it to 25% around the world. And if, if solar or, and wind and other forms of renewables are going to make it to be 90% of, mean 90% of our energy requirements, it's gonna take 100 years. if we don't crack on and do it. So, so I, I hope I've frightened you to death. <laughs> right, I've, given, I've given you all the bad news. Right? What I'm gonna tell you now is essentially good news. And the good news is, um, yeah, we have a world that's in long-term crisis, um, but we have all the technology essentially that we need available to us. We just need to work out how to implement it. So there's too many people, there's not enough energy or food, we have unsustainable economic growth, we, we have human-powered climate change, and we need for all these people security and energy. And in the medium term, it's there, coal, oil, gas, some renewables. We have nuclear power available, we can install more, because that doesn't have a big carbon burden. But in the long time, in the long term, we absolutely need to go back to being a solar-powered economy all over the world. And that needs grid storage. It needs different energy vectors. It needs lots of investment in infrastructure. And in terms of food security, we need, we need to do new science. We need to take the benefits of the green revolution in terms of productivity but what that did was it disconnected the plants from the land. So soil, the soil in most modern farming is essentially there to hold the plants upright. And the farming's hydroponic. Yeah, you need water and then the farmer provides everything else. The plants take very little from the soil. They've lost contact with the soil. And more importantly, they've lost contact with all the other things that live in the soil. So we need new science to make new crops, to generate new farming. And the reason, the reason I'm here is that when I took my job as Dean of Science at the University of Sheffield, I was looking for a story to tell. And in our maths department, we had people who worked on, on the sun, how the sun worked. In the physics department, we had people who worked on capturing the sun's energy and transform it in, transforming it into electricity. In the chemistry department, we had people who made the molecules that act as the antenna to capture that energy. And they worked with the biologists on, on the mechanics of photosynthesis. So the, the molecular biology department looks at how photosynthesis works in the membrane of the plant. But also in molecular biology, they had people working on 
On stomata, they're the little valves on the underside of leaves that allow the carbon dioxide in, but unfortunately allow water out. So they worked on plant physiology with the animal and plant scientists, the botanists. And the botanists also did whole earth ecology. So they modelled global cycling of, uh, of nitrogen and carbon, and they worked with the mathematicians. And all of a sudden, I've gone round the whole science faculty, and we had a story to tell that had the sun in the middle. And, and the power of all that research together in the same place uh, meant that now we'd recognise that they all worked on the same things. They all fundamentally worked on the same things. Then they could start to work together. So I'm just going to give you a few vignettes of our research portfolio uh, in solar physics, in photovoltaics, in photosynthesis, in food security and in global change. So, so why, why study the sun? So when I was a kid, um, growing up in the UK, I was told that the energy would be free. Yeah, uh, and the Labour government had told my parents that the white heater technology, electricity is going to be so cheap you won't even have to pay for it because of the nuclear power. For me, that promise was fusion power. We're going to have fusion power. It's 25 years away, right? Uh, that was when I was 18. I'm 52 now. It's still 25 years away. Right? Um, if we understand the sun, we can understand how to use the sun. Because then we can take our energy from the sun, and it is the ultimate fusion reactor. And these two, wave power, wind power, they're actually both solar power. Because the wind is caused by the earth heating up differentially and, and the atmosphere moving around, and the wind causes the surface waves that have been harvested here. So wind power is a renewable that comes from the sun. And, and the, the top picture is from Denmark, where they have a massive installed capacity. And the bottom picture is from China, where they have a massive installed capacity. In fact, Chinese wind power capacity now exceeds their nuclear capacity. However, they're installing coal-fired capacity even faster. So we, in the really developed world of Western Europe and the US and Japan, really need to lead the way for the BRICS, for the, for the Brazils, the, the Russia, the India, the China, in getting our renewable energy capacity installed. So the Holy Grail is, is, is using the sunlight directly to make electricity. Um, this house could be from somewhere in the northwest, right? It's, um, it's got solar panels on. Um, more than enough energy reaches us from the sun. Uh, the problems are collection, converting that energy into electricity, but really intermittency. Yeah? If, if, if everything was dependent on solar panels, wouldn't be a very good day today, right? Um, and how do you get through the night? Sun doesn't shine then. Or how do you get through the winter when you need more energy than the summer, when there's more sunshine? If we could solve these problems, the area required to meet the USA's current energy needs just by photovoltaics using 10% efficient solar panels would be that small area in Nevada. Right, the problem is, how do we get that much capacity installed? How do we get it distributed? Because as I've told you already, we only need to collect an hour of the sun's energy to drive the whole economy for a year. Uh, Gerald Ford, uh, God bless him, said, um, solar power it ain't going to happen overnight. <laughs> And, and that, is, that is the problem uh, we need to solve. We need to get round this intermittency issue. So, so again, a, a little vignette of our research. So, so I'm, a, I'm a polymer chemist and I work on polymer morphology, on, on how molecules are organised. So this is a diagram of a, of a solar cell that's made essentially by printing at atmospheric, temperature and room pre atmospheric pressure and room temperature. 
And, and we've developed all sorts of techniques to understand how the molecules organize themselves and how efficient the cells are. So we work at the molecular level. Um, but we also have on the top of our physics building a solar farm where, where we actually power part of the physics department and use this as a test bed for solar panels. So we have real world experience of how solar panels can be used in applications. In fact, the, um, <clears throat> I, I, my phone's in the back of, of Alan's car, but, uh, but I have a little app on the phone that you put the phone down um, and it uses the GPS signal to work out where you are and the, um, the weather information uh, to work out what the sunshine's going to be. Then if you tell it the solar panel on the inverter, it will tell you how much you can expect to yield from that solar panel and what direction to point it in and at which angle to mount it. Uh, and it's, and it's, that's a collaboration between physicists and mathematicians. Now, now these things, kind of making these things widely available are part of, of what we do, so both molecular and real world. But here's another example that doesn't suffer from intermittency. So this is, this is called Gem Solar, it's in Spain, and um, you can see there's a big tower in the middle, and there are little devices on the ground that are actually mirrors, and, and they're heliostat mirrors, so they follow the sun, and they, they focus the sun's energy on the tower, and the tower contains molten salt. And then the molten salt's really, really hot, 1300 degrees centigrade. And, uh, and that, that drives a heat pump, so, that, so the, the hot salt boils water, and then the boiled water makes steam that drives a turbine that makes electricity. Because there's so much energy stored in the hot salt, even if the sun doesn't shine for a couple of days, it still produces electricity, and the temperature just falls. Then when the sun shines again, you can heat the salt up. So, so there are different ways of getting around the intermittency problem. Now, now often you have to turn wind turbines off uh, because the grid can't take the load. So here's a way that, that's been developed in Sheffield uh, by a company called ITM Power of, of balancing the load on the grid. So now what they do is they have a, a, an ele electrolyzer. So they, they use electricity to split water and that soaks power out the grid. And there often, there are times a day when the, when the electricity generators want power taken out, they'll pay you to take power out the grid. And when you do that, you make hydrogen, okay? And then the hydrogen, you can actually put back in the town gas. So you could sell that to the gas company. So you paid to take electricity out the grid and you paid for the hydrogen that you make. And in Europe, there's three times more energy in the gas grid than there is in the electricity grid, so it can act as a big buffer. So there are ways around these problems, but as you might imagine, there are vested interests in the way of making this happen. But the holy grail for this kind of research are solar fuels. So turning sunlight directly into stored energy in a chemical bond. The first step of which is splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. And then you can either use the electron that's generated to drive a chemical reaction, um, or you could actually make carbohydrate. And the carbohydrate of choice would be methanol, because methanol's uh, a liquid. You can use the existing liquid fuel infrastructure, um, and then you end up with a circular energy economy, uh, where you're taking carbon dioxide out of the air to make a carbohydrate, you're burning the carbohydrate, which releases the carbon again. Uh, and all of a sudden, it starts to look like one of those early cycles, and, and it's carbon neutral. What about photosynthesis? Well, this, this map is, uh, the, the colors are the variation in blue-green algae on an annual basis. So in the sea, there's a little bug called Prochlorococcus. There are, um, 100,000 of those cells per milliliter of water. So there's 10 to the power 28 cells on the Earth at any one time. They turn over in a day and a half. So that's 10 to the 30 cells per year, one with 30 noughts after it of these cells. If you collected them and dried them out and weighed them, there'd be 10 to the 11 tons of this stuff, this bug. 
and there are only 10 to the 8 tons of human beings. There's a thousand times more mass of this one organism in the sea than there are of people. And their job for the last two and a half billion years has been to keep the Earth's atmosphere at 20% oxygen. Now, because we're putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the surface of the seawater is getting more acidic, and these little bugs won't be able to make their shells, because the mineral that they use won't crystallize at that pH. And if we screw this up, we are really stuffed. Right? So photosynthesis is really, really important to us as human beings as food, but more importantly, as the stability of the atmosphere. So in Sheffield, we study the two basic reactions of photosynthesis, the light reaction and the dark reaction. We have people who work on the molecular structure of the photosynthetic complex, the proteins that are organized together in the leaf. We also have people working on food security. How can we deliver enough food? So just, just a couple of statistics. So we're going for 7 billion, 8 billion, 9 billion, 10 billion, how, who knows where. At the moment, there are a billion people who are chronically undernourished. There are 180 million children who are severely underweight, and there are 400 million women who are anemic. All because of a lack of food. Now, there's plenty of food on the earth. There's plenty of food available, but not to them. Because we, in the West, waste a whole load of food. It's in the new, on the page four of the New York Times today. Big article about food waste. Estimates are, in Western Europe, about 20% of food's wasted. In the USA, about 30% of all available foods wasted, thrown in the, just thrown away. In Africa, per capita food intake is 20% less today than it was in 1960. If that was a story about the UK or about the USA, it'd be great news, right? People ate 20% less. We'd have a healthier population. There wouldn't be type 2 diabetes. There wouldn't be all those issues. In Africa, it's a real big deal because people are actually starving. And they're starving because we have inappropriate use of agricultural technology. And food demand is going to increase by 50% by 2030 and perhaps double by 2050 because those people who are, there were a billion, billion of us who were kind of crazy consumers and there were three billion who were trying to catch us up. As they get wealthier, they're going to demand more protein. And more protein means meat, and meat means grain. So there's going to be a greater um, pressure put on the agricultural system to provide all that food. So we work on the whole thing from the molecular structure of the proteins in the plants to the physiology of the plants using model organisms uh, like Arodopsis uh, to growing plants in fields. And this is rice outside the uh, International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. But the green revolution uh, meant we can feed 7 billion people. Now, we have this guy in England called Prince Charles, right? And uh, he has a few daft ideas. Uh, one, one of which is that, that we'd have a much better earth if we all were organic, if we all went organic. But as I've shown you already, the, the consumption of oil and the earth's population are intimately linked because we existentially depend on this artificial fertilizer. If we used all the organic fertilizer we had to grow food, we'd be able to feed three billion people. So Prince Charles, tell me, which four billion people do we starve to death so we can live the way you want? Uh, I have asked him that question, uh, and it was after I'd received my order of the British Empire for Services and Service. <laughs> But the purpose of this picture to illustrate this is our food system at the moment depends on power stations generating electricity 
by burning coal, or in this case, nuclear fuel, to make fertilizer to grow cereals. And all of these foods, all the good stuff, they've also benefited from the Green Revolution. And these plants are not connected to the soil anymore. So one of the things we're working on is transforming the photosynthetic mechanism of rice. So with the Bill and Linda, um, with the Gates Foundation, uh, we're working on taking C4 photosynthesis from maize and putting that into rice. And if you do that, you can get three crops a year. And to do it, you need to do GM. And when you do GM, you can get rid of the fertilizer and the pesticide because you can actually bring back genes that have laid dormant and reconnect the plants with the soil. So you use less fertilizer, less herbicide, less pesticide. Wheat's really, really difficult to manipulate. So when the plant breeding was done, it was bred for one trait, which was seed yield. It's a hexaploid genetic, so it, so it has six chromosomes, not, not, they're not in pairs. So, so the, the genetic problem becomes six to the power n rather than two to the power n. So it's really, really complicated, really, really quickly. So we've developed algorithms around wheat genetics so we can breed plants using conventional plant breeding, not GM, but to activate the genes you need to reconnect the plants with the soil and with the microbes that live in the soil, GM is really the only way to do it quickly. And if you learn more about agriculture, this is um, a slide about some work a colleague of mine, uh, Julie Hyde's doing. And, um, and she, she works on, on co-cropping. So you can actually, if you understand the genetics, you can use one crop to protect another crop from a parasite. So this beautiful flower um, is called Striger. And what Striger does is if you have maize growing and you don't have enough fertilizer for the maize to outcompete the Striger, the Striger literally taps into the roots of the maize and sucks all the nutrition out of them. If you give it fertilizer, the Striger doesn't survive because the maize grows too fast. But if you co-crop with, a, with, a, with another legume that's actually quite useful as an animal feed, uh, you can get rid of the fertilizer and get rid of the striga and feed animals and humans from the same field. But you need to understand the whole system and they're the kinds of things we're working on. So we need a solar revolution and perhaps we need that solar revolution on farms, um, whether it be fields that are harvesting solar energy or intensive farms that are using solar energy. In this case, in the bottom corner, it's a, a tomato production facility uh, that works all the year round uh, based on the solar panels. But we also need a brown revolution because as a human resource, we're wasting and it's brown, <laughs> right? Because everything that goes in here comes out of here. Right? And we need to learn to recycle every atom because at the moment, nitrogen's free. We take it out of the air. That's not a problem. But we're going to approach a phosphorus crisis. Because at the moment, we're taking mineral phosphorus and pumping it into the sea. Because we're throwing it away. In Victorian times, n n no turds were wasted. <laughs> right? Kids chased horses down the street to collect the nitrogen and the phosphorus. It had real economic value. And we need to, we need to realize that we have to use every atom and use it over. We have no problem with animal manure, so why do we have a problem with human manure? If it's treated properly, it works. So my message for, for you and for Prince Charles is this. Mod, <laughs> mod, modern agriculture will be organic, uh, but it'll be GM crops, and they'll be fertilized with human excrement, and we'll all be fine. And then, and then to the, the, the global change in the environment. So, so we've already talked about the hockey sticks. Our modelers, so the people who model the Earth, um, 
can predict within, have models that will predict within a, 100 kilometers uh, the weather. Well, well, actually not the weather, because that's variable, the climate, okay? And what they can do is they can turn up the rain. Yeah, they have various numbers. They can turn the rain up, they can turn the sunshine up, they can turn it down, they can turn the cloud cover up. Um, and predict the amount of photosynthesis. So, for example, um, if you increase the temperature, uh, the photosynthesis goes up. So global warming should drive photosynthesis up. Um, but if you increase the radiation by kind of burning off the cloud cover, uh, photosynthesis goes down because you lose more water. The, the stomata on the back of the plants allow the water to go out. Uh, for the chemists in the room, there's about Avogadro's number of stomata on the face of the earth, 10 to the 23 uh, stomata on the backs of plants. Um, and that is, that is a, an estimate with an with a order of magnitude variation on. But, you know, the, the, we, we have the ability to make these predictions. So we want to solve the whole global food energy cycle. How human beings interact with their environment, how we use water, how we use energy, how we use food. So, so this is, this, this, I have a smart board in my office and we were just kind of sketching out, you know, what we might want to do research on. So, so one of the things you could do is, um, if you burn biomass, you get carbon dioxide and heat, and you can use the heat to generate electricity, okay? Then if you have a source of hydrogen, you can convert that, carbon dioxide into a carbohydrate again, and then use that carbon again. So you get to use the carbon twice before it goes back into the environment. Um, so the, the carbon, the, the hydrogen could come from photovoltaics, it could come from nuclear. And actually the carbon dioxide could come from fossil fuels. So a short term solution would be to build a nuclear power station next to a coal fired power station. And then you could use every carbon atom twice, use not use hydrogen made from the nuclear power and the carbon dioxide from the coal, okay? Now, I don't know what planning permission's like here for building things, but getting planning permission to build a nuclear power station and a coal-fired power station next to each other ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Certainly not near me. <laughs> but it's a, it's a really obvious thing to do to a scientist. And because we can do the modeling and we can, we can model how plants work, we can actually run those climate predictions to design plants for maximum productivity, depending on the climate conditions, wherever they are in the world and how they change. In fact, the most energy intensive research we do at the university is into the effects of climate change. The biggest electricity bill comes from the botany department where they have growth chambers that can recreate temperature, insulation, carbon dioxide levels in growth chambers. So we can do those predictions. All of this is written up in a book called Project Sunshine. They're not available for sale at the back. Um, <laughs> it's now out in paperback and the title's changed to The Solar Revolution. Um, it got good reviews, but it's not sold very many. We've had a big donation from a, 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 a philanthropic organization called the Grantham Trust, uh, the Grantham Foundation, and, uh, and we have cohorts of PhD students now across a wide range of disciplines, from arts and humanities through to nuclear physics, who are all being educated together in the big picture as well as their uh, specific detail. This has become a, a really important part of the University of Sheffield's mission. Uh, and occupies about a third of our research. I so this we is something we care passionately about as a university and are advocates of. Um, I've, I've given some strong opinions. I, I'm sure you'll, there'll be many of you who disagree with them. And, uh, and I'll be happy showing you what I've discovered and hope to understand uh, to take those questions. Thank you very much. We have some time for a few questions. Yeah. First hand up. 
First, I want to thank you for one of the best presentations I've seen at this excellent place. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> About a year, yes. About a year ago, a scientist gave a talk. His name was Nocera, and he talked about splitting uh, uh, water for hydrogen using a catalyst and copying photosynthesis. Yep. What is the latest on hydrogen fuel? So, so one, one of the pictures I showed was, uh, I don't know whether it was from his lab, the, there's been a massive investment in the US. So the, there are groups on both the East Coast and the West Coast working with the National Renewable Energy Labs. Um, so so the, the best photovoltaic panels are up to about 20%, uh, organic photovoltaic panels are up to about 20% efficiency. That should translate into market. Uh, being able to, to make solar fuel is, is something we still need to work really, really hard on. Water splitting technology isn't right yet to be commercially viable. Any other questions? There's a, there's a, a chap at the back who had his hand up and then a, a lady here. Thanks. Uh, the estimate of 10 billion people seems to be a given now. Several years ago, you used to hear about zero population growth quite a bit, and then it just died off. Uh -huh. uh, did everybody decide it just wasn't worth it? Uh, well, no, so I think, I think we, we, we will have zero population growth, but, but not until every bunch of two billions had the chance to reproduce. So, so I think we, we will most likely reach some steady state in that, whether it's nine or 11, who knows. Um, but it will be around that number, and, and I'm pretty sure it will level off if we're lucky, if we get the opportunity for it to level off. Because we might not. There was a, a lady here. You already answered one of my questions about the uh, solar fuels and their viability, but what is your opinion about are we in peak oil now? Have we passed it? Are we getting to it? And how is that going to relate to when photovoltaics then get affordable and a actually used method? Okay, so, so um, I, I don't know whether we're at peak, peak oil because, um, you know, who, who could have predicted 10 years ago how much gas would get fracked? Um, the, the problem that we face is that these two energy systems aren't on a level playing field, right? So, so if, you, if you burn fossil fuels, all you do is you pay the price of digging them out of the ground and that's it, right? You don't pay the price of the loss of amenity for future generations. You don't pay the price of the change to the atmosphere, yeah? Uh, consequently, the, the, the price per kilowatt hour or the price per joule or whatever, however you want to call it, is really, really low. And consequently, these new technologies can't compete with that price because it's, at the moment, it's about four times the price for a photovoltaic jewel than a, than a fossil fuel jewel. So no one's going to invest in PV kind of in, for the long term because the price differential is so different in the short term. So, so the market is not going to solve this problem for us. The mark, all the market will do is drive us further and further and further towards higher carbon dioxide levels. How about one more question? All right, well, let's thank our speaker.